Hi, and welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mary Asher. Thanks for spending some time with us today. On today's episode, I'm joined by award-winning author Dara Horn, whose new book, People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present, challenges readers to confront the reasons why there might be so much fascination with Jewish deaths and why there is often little respect for Jewish lives in America and across the globe. But first, one quick reminder. Check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut, an NFL player, and a legendary DJ. And watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Well, few writers or historians have thoroughly explored the subtle ways in which non-Jewish societies, including contemporary America, pressure or gaslight Jews into modifying or erasing their own identity altogether. Yet it's a provocative concept that deserves thought and attention in a world, once again, witnessing alarming spikes, anti-Semitism and the whitewashing or erasure of Jewish history. With me to discuss these nuances and her new book, People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present, is author Dara Horn. Horn is the author of six books, including the novels In the Image, The World to Come, and Eternal Life. She's the recipient of two National Jewish Book Awards and has been a finalist for the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, while her books have been selected as New York Times Notable Books and Book Lists 25 Best Books of the Decade. Horn's nonfiction work has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and more. She holds a doctorate in Hebrew and Yiddish literature from Harvard University. Dara, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, before we explore both the contents of your book and the key ideas driving your exploration of Jewish history, tell us a little about your own journey and how you've sort of created your own lane with this book. So that leads to questions like, what or who inspired you? Uh, You've written a lot of fiction uh, as well. Uh, Did the theme of this new nonfiction work evolve out of the fictional narratives that you've created? And one other thought, you talk in the book about the tragedy at the Tree of Life Synagogue, perhaps being a a catalyst uh, for doing this book. What prompted you to to write it? And what were the specific moments or incidents uh, that prompted you to consider uh, how uh, Jewish identity, Jewish history, uh, has been defined and determined by the opinions and projection of others? Sure. Well, well, that was a lot to to take on, but I'll try. Um, So, yeah, I I was writing novels before I wrote this book. Um, I mean, I published quite a bit of nonfiction as well. And you know, various newspapers, magazines, periodicals, that kind of thing. But I really was writing fiction. And in my, my fiction is really inspired a lot by my, by my academic work in Yiddish and Hebrew literature. When I was a student studying Hebrew and Yiddish literature, I was extremely jealous of the writers I was studying. Um, I wasn't jealous of their wives, which mostly were quite horrible, but rather I was jealous of their language because I felt like there was this, um, there's an archaeology of belief that's beneath every language um, that native speakers don't even hear, right? Um, it's sort of something that comes to the surface every time someone sneezes. And in Jewish languages, those kinds of references that are just woven into a language are from the Torah and the, uh, and the Tanakh and the Talmud and all this sort of like large edifice of, of, um, of Jewish texts. And I often felt there was this kind of sense of inauthenticity in American Jewish life. And, you know, there was always this sense that like whatever American Jews were doing was sort of like, you know, some pale imitation of some real Jewish life that was happening in some other place or some other time. And what I realized was that that sense of inauthenticity came from a lack of a language. And so what I tried to do in my novels was to write Jewish literature in English as though English were a Jewish language. And what I mean by that is writing novels that really were drawing on Jewish texts, but that any reader could read. So my five novels all draw on Jewish culture, history, tradition, religion in lots of different ways and in lots of different historical settings, contemporary settings. But what I found was that I would um, 
a lot of this material is totally new to my readers and I include my Jewish readers in that. And I always was pushing back against this idea that Jewish life was defined by what other people did to the Jews. Um, this idea that like, you know, that Jewish identity was based on this history of persecution was always something I was pushing very hard against. I used to ask people in my public events when I would speak about my, my novels, I would ask the audience, how many people here can name four concentration camps? And that's often something a lot of readers can do. I would then ask those same people, how many of you can name four Yiddish writers? 80% of the people murdered in the Holocaust were Yiddish speakers, the famously literary culture. And then I would ask those people, you know, why do we care so much about how these people died if we care so little about how they live? Um, but, you know, now I sort of feel like I was kind of naive in presenting this because I had not yet appreciated at that point this sort of like behemoth role that Jews play in a non-Jewish society's imagination. And that kind of takes me to um, how I started writing this book. Um, I started thinking about this more seriously after, like, as I said, I spent 20 years not writing this book. Um, you know, I had the knowledge of the information and all that that I could have to write this book 20 years ago when I published my first novel. I spent 20 years avoiding this topic. Um, and what happened was in 2018, I was approached by Smithsonian Magazine and they asked me if I would write an essay for them about Anne Frank. And I got that request and I just felt this overwhelming dread because I thought, wow, I really don't want to write about Anne Frank. And, you know, the logical thing to do would have been to turn this assignment down. But I'm not a very logical person. I mean, that's why I'm a writer. Um, so I just sort of thought, this is interesting. Why don't I want to do this? And one thing I've learned in 20 years of writing is, or publishing books, is that the uncomfortable moments are usually where the story is. So I sort of thought to myself, why am I not, why don't I want to do this? Why is this so uncomfortable? And then I remembered a news item that had appeared about the, in 2018, about the Anne Frank Museum, which is you know, this museum in Amsterdam where Anne Frank and her family and some other people were hiding from the Nazis. This museum, this building where she was hiding is now like this blockbuster museum. They get 2 million visitors a year. The news item I had read was describing how there was a young Jewish man who worked at this museum and his employer, the museum, would not allow him to wear his yarmulke to work. They made him hide it under a baseball hat. And he then appealed this decision to the board of the museum. And the board of the museum deliberated about this for four months and then finally relented and they let him wear his yarmulke to work. And I had read that story and I just thought, you know, four months is a really long time for the Anne Frank house to ponder whether or not it was a good idea to force a Jew into hiding. And, you know, I just was looking this up. I was, I remembered this story and then I was just looking for it. And I found another story, which is very similar from the same museum in 2017, which was when visitors noticed something weird about the audio guide display there, where, you know, they have like 10 languages and, you know, each one there's, it says English and there's a British flag and it says Francais and there's a French flag until you get to Hebrew, Hebrew, no flag. And I just thought, you know, these are, PR mishaps, but they're not mistakes. And so that's when I wrote this. So I did write that piece for, um, for Smithsonian and the opening line of my piece is, people love dead Jews, living Jews, not so much. Because I realized there's this erasure that, that Jews are expected to undertake in order to be part of any kind of public conversation. And so um, anyway, that was, a, that was a long answer to a short question. Um, but that, that piece became, that's actually now the first chapter of this book. So the, the people in the title um, refers to people, largely non-Jews and Jews. Who, who are the people? I mean, I think it's anyone who's participating in a larger non-Jewish society. So that's non-Jews, but obviously there are many Jews who are participating as I am as an English language writer in a non-Jewish society. Um, you know, but it's not this sort of internal, um, internal conversation, which is quite different. Um, so, you know, so I wrote that piece. What, what, one thing I would mention about it is that that piece came out in the fall. You mentioned the Tree of Life shooting. That piece came out in the fall of 2018. And it was like within a week of when that piece was published that the, that the, the shooting happened at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. And it, in Pittsburgh. And I, like, it was like within hours of that attack that the New York Times called me and were like, 
you know, do you want to write about this? And as I put it in the book, I became the New York Times' go-to person for the emerging literary genre of synagogue shooting op-eds. And I just sort of realized, like, there's this thing that my editors and so want me to do with this subject. They want me to tell stories that, the, about dead Jews that make people feel better about themselves. And so when you say people, who is it? Is it Jews, non-Jews? I mean, it really is everyone, it's, it's, but it is referring to a larger non-Jewish society. And to me, it's sort of not even that relevant whether or not the, the editor who's assigning that to me is Jewish or not, because they're not assigning it for a Jewish publication, right? They're assigning it for this broader publication. Well, describe, you're a well-traveled person. Describe your uh, encounters with Jewish heritage sites, uh, Holocaust memorials, Jewish history museums, which uh, sometime only come to fruition, as you say, after the last Jew leaves, or as in several Mediterranean countries today, after the first Jews return. Um, can the experiences of these places really be rewritten so that the effect of these, of these sites uh, can be uh, positive? And for a people like ours that has lived in dozens and dozens of countries, so many places, isn't remembrance important? I'll give you one example, personal example. Um, I've been back to, the, uh, to my mother's shtetl in Lithuania several times. First time I went, I was at the edge of the town, there were only 100 families total in that town uh, in 1941 uh, when the Nazis entered Lithuania. Um, and uh, so there were 45 Jewish families, maybe 55 non-Jewish families, and there was a, a cemetery with only about 12 stones. That's it, 12 gravestones, and, and that was it. And I, 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 I was appalled. And I asked one of the local folks there what happened. And they said, well, in the early 1960s, remember it was the Soviet Union, they needed to expand the, the boundaries of the kolkhoz, of the, of the communal farm, and they just plowed under you know, the stones. That's, that's what they did. Well, I wasn't satisfied with that. I went to legislators in the uh, Lithuanian Semis, uh, and when I came back the next time, a year or two later, there was a monument which said that on this site was a Jewish cemetery, et cetera. And it's important, there are descendants like me who come from Mexico, Israel, and other places, and they come back to this place. So isn't remembrance important? And so how do we balance what you write about? You write about Harbin in, in China, for example, and how the old core center of Jewish center of the, of the city has been restored. How do we balance all of that? Sure. Well, so, I mean, as I put it in the book, you know, there's this tourist industry concept called Jewish heritage sites, which is a term that's a brilliant marketing technique, because of course it sounds so much better than property seized from dead or expelled Jews, right? Like who wants to go to that? Um, and I do have a, a long essay in the book about this city in, called Harbin, which is in northeastern China. This was a city that was largely built by Russian Jews in the early 20th century. Um, today, there is um, exactly one Jew in this town. Um, there's It's so remote that there's not even a Chabad, <laughs> which tells you what you need to know. Um, I didn't say that in the book. Um, but yes, there's only uh, one there's one remaining Jew in this town, um, but it, but there's um, the government there decided to spend thirty million dollars restoring Jewish heritage sites. And what I thought was so interesting about that is that they say the quiet part out loud. And what I mean by that is the they held um, conferences that were titled International Forum for Economic Cooperation between Harbin and the World's Jews. And the mayor of Harbin gave a speech about how the wonder, how wonderful the Jews are and how we have such wonderful Jewish role models like J.P. Morgan and Nelson Rockefeller, neither of whom are Jewish, in case you were curious. Um, and, you know, and literally he says, you know, the money of the world is in the pockets of the Jews. And this is why we want them to come to Harbin and give us their money. So it's like, you know, this and then you go. So, I mean, it's very, very you know, openly cynical that their goal is basically to get Jewish tourists and they hope investors to come to Harbin. I don't know how successful they've been, but like you go to the museum in Harbin, this Jewish museum, and I mean, they have like an exhibit where there are like life-size plaster sculptures of people where it'll be like just like a life-size plaster man sitting at a desk with a key, with a typewriter on it. And the caption says, real Jewish businessman in Harbin, right? And then you go to the next room and it's like, you know, 
two plaster kids playing with toys and it's like real Jewish children in Harbin. Um, I mean, it's like cigar store Indians, right? And then you walk down the street and, this, and there's like plaques on these historic homes that say, you know, this, ha this house was built by a Jew. Um, so, I mean, you know, this is like, was just sort of this, you know, and that, and that's with all of the efforts of this one Jew in Harbin, this man named Don Ben Kanan, who is like a very um, passionate historian. And he's, you know, he really is an expert in this. And he worked very hard with the government to try to do this right. Um, I mean, it's like, it, it was just this sort of like ridiculousness of this project and how openly cynical it was. Um, you know, you see this in a lot of places in the world. And I want to be clear. Um, I am not arguing that like Jewish historical sites in various places in the world, and there are a lot of them, shouldn't be preserved. That is not what I'm saying at all. What I'm suggesting is that there are better and worse ways to do this. Um, there are cynical and less cynical ways of doing this. Um, there are there are places where these are done by you know very learned people who are very sincere and devoted and really put a lot of effort in and make this you know and and really are willing to teach you something about the history, but in a sincere way. I mean, the other thing is you go to the Harbin Jewish Museum, it doesn't tell you anything about why this community doesn't live there anymore. Not mentioned. Um, you know, and then of course there are many places in Eastern Europe where you know there are places where they're honest about it, and there are places where they aren't. Um, you know, I mean, and then there are places where these sites are completely destroyed or gone. So, I mean, I think there's a range of how you want to look at this, but I think that um, I'll give an example of, of a way that I think is better, although I haven't been to this place myself because I haven't been to Poland in about 20 years. Um, I know that there's a, a Jewish museum in Warsaw now called Poline, which is um, relatively new. I think it's open in about 10 years. Um, and what's, I think, you know, in, important about that museum's project is that it is not a museum about the destruction of the Jewish community. It's a museum about Polish Jewish history. Like this museum tells you about all the history of these Hasidic dynasties and the history of all these different, you know, political movements and Jewish literature and theater. And it's like, it's about Jewish life in Poland. It's not about how this was destroyed. So, you know, I mean, I think that that, and, and that, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into that. And I mean, and that research is largely, you know, being done by people who probably aren't Jewish, right? I mean, and most of the people who go to that museum are not Jewish. So, you know, there are different, better and worse ways of doing it. Um, but what I'm calling out is really, you know, and it's funny because I've had um, some readers who have said to me like, oh, you're so cynical, how you're presenting these things. And I'm like, I don't think I'm the cynical one. When the mayor of Harbin is making speeches about wonderful Jews like J.P. Morgan, like what I'm pointing out is the cynicism of this enterprise, which unfortunately is the case in a lot of places in the world. And I mean, and the reality is like in the book, I talk about um, Benjamin of Tudela, who was a 12th century uh, Spanish Jewish merchant who traveled around the known world at the time, which was mostly the Mediterranean, um, documenting Jewish communities and all these sort of, for him, far-flung places. And what I say in the book is, you know, now as a Jewish traveler, you go to all these places in the world, like Benjamin of Tudela did, but you're not visiting Jewish communities, you're visiting their graves. And I mean, that's just a, a reality that we all are living with in the 21st century. You know, you make a good point about the, the, the museum in Warsaw. Um, to to this, which I haven't seen. To this, I, you know, to this weird. extent, um, you know, I've I've always said that I think one of the things that that we need to do more of is to um, present the many contributions that we have made to, in this case, American civilization. We're living here, civilization in general. To tell to tell our story, uh, you know, there uh, there was a story recently on one of the Jewish websites. Uh, about the new museum of the Academy of Motion Picture Art, Picture uh, Arts and Sciences, you may have seen this, um, which says that there really isn't, there's not a place in that museum for the story of the Jewish founders of the motion picture industry. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that, that the contributions part, whether it be in Poland, culture, the arts, publishing, journalism, uh, or whatever it is here, medicine, technology, all of the things that we know, I think that's that's an extremely important point for us to make. Do you do you feel the same way about that? That contributions, talking about not only Jews who have lived before, but Jews who are living today. I mean, isn't that isn't that important uh, to future remembrance? Yes. Well, so there's a couple things that a couple things that work here. Um, one is the um, there's 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 a couple things. One is if you think about the way that we teach 
history to children, like not in a Jewish context, in like a broader you know context, context in it's certainly in this country. Um, think about like a social studies textbook for you know middle school or high school. What does it say in that textbook about Jews? Well, if it's an ancient history textbook, there's going to be like maybe a page about the Israelites who generally doesn't even mention that those people were Jews, right? I mean, they might as well be Phoenicians. They're dead a long time ago. Like who, you know, who cares? And then if it's a textbook that has modern history, there's a chapter toward the end about the Holocaust. So like, okay, Jews are people who got murdered and then, you know, their murders teach us some like grand lesson about the limits of civilization. And there's nothing in between, right? There's nothing in between at all. And so I think that there's this, that when you talk about the contributions to civilization, it's so I, I would go deeper than what you're saying. I would say, yes, it's important for people to know that, you know, I'll you know, name fill in the blank famous people were Jews. That's important. Yes. Um, but what I think is more important is the contribution of Judaism to Western civilization. And that is what is erased. Um, and when I say erased, I mean that you, not just that it's erased because it's just not in the book, because I mean, it's not like the Jews are not like, you know, the Yazidis where like, you know, this is sort of this group that just stayed in one place and didn't have much of an impact on the rest of civilization. Judaism is like a foundation of the entire history and culture of the West. And that is completely erased. And the, I think the reason it's erased is because there is this attitude we have. There's, first of all, that there's a problem if we were to present it, which is that it would make us realize how wrong we are about a lot of the assumptions we make about civilization. And those and that would make us feel bad about ourselves. And here's what I mean by that. Um, you know, I think that we often have this attitude in the United States where we teach people not to be bigoted by teaching them that, oh, see that group of people, whoever they are, you know, you shouldn't hate them because they're just like everybody else. They're just like you and me, right? That's like the way we teach children how not to be bigoted. But the problem is, you know, Jews spent 3,000 years not being like, not being like everybody else, right? That was sort of the point of Judaism was to not be like everybody else, right? Since ancient times. And Judaism is like this counterculture that weaves its way through the history of the West. And when I say that, um, you know, sort of talking about Jewish history would like, would sort of ruin what we think about Western history. I'm going to give you just one minor example of this, like a really tiny example. Of this. Think about the way we learn, we teach children about literacy, right? We, if, you know, in school, you learn that like, until the printing press was invented, most people didn't know how to read. You know, like only people who knew how to read were like wealthy people, nobles, clergy, the royalty. But then, hooray, there's the printing press. And then, hooray, a couple, you know, a little bit later, industrial production. And suddenly we have this like cheap, you know, way of mass media. And that's when suddenly poor people are enabled to or are, are able to learn how to read. It's a nice story, but it turns out to be a total lie if you include Jewish history in that story, because you know, of course, you know, Jews had universal male literacy like a thousand years before the printing press, right? I mean, poor, poor Jewish children in, in rural Yemen in the ninth century knew how to read, right? So if you learned that, suddenly you'd have to tell people that, no, actually, you can have mass literacy without technology and wealth. You just need to think that reading matters, Right. Well, that would sort of undermine a lot of what we're teaching children about progress and history. I mean, so it kind of would undo a lot of what we think about civilization in general when you realize that there's this like resilient counterculture that's running through it. So I think it's a much bigger educational revolution that we would need rather than just sort of like having in the textbook that, you know, Jonah Salk was Jewish. Right. Because, you know, Jonah Salk being Jewish is, you know, that's nice. But like what we're talking about is a much bigger, like, you know, cultural challenge. Um, you know, that that sort of, you know, first of all, runs through the whole history of the West, but also really kind of challenges the history of the West in a lot of ways. So, yeah, I do. I think that that learning about living Jews is important. Yeah. But like in a much bigger way, even than you suggest. Well, as a as a six year old standing in line waiting to get my first polio shot, um, you know, Salk uh, loomed very big in in the in the the minds of, of Jews at that time. There was a great deal of pride in the fact that he was a man who was contributing uh, to ending uh, the scourge of polio. So I, I get the point. It can be on, on different levels. I want to go back to remembrance for a minute, because you write in the book about a very interesting uh, organization, Diarna, uh, which is a, a demographic digital mapping uh, organization doing work in North Africa, but now it's kind of spreading out. Uh, tell us about how that 
experience of, of interviewing and speaking with the people from Diyarna affected um, your, uh, your view of how we do remembrance in the 21st century? Um, yeah, Diarna is a geo museum, which is it's an online virtual museum and archive of Jewish historical sites in what's I mean, now they have them uh, from around the world, but it's really with starting with um, the Islamic world, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and it's just an astonishing project because a lot of these are, you know, these were communities that in a lot of cases predated Islam um, that were thousands of years old. Um, and that really have been, you know, completely wiped out um, in a lot of these cases. And, you know, the situations that led to that vary by country. Um, but you have, I mean, I'll just give one example of if the data is kind of astonishing that like in Libya, the city of Tripoli in 1940 was 25% Jewish. Today, there are zero Jews in Libya. Um, and it's a very similar situation in a lot of countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and so what Diarna has done is they are basically documenting um, with photography um, and oral history. And, you know, and when I say photography, it's not just like dude with a camera. It's like, you know, they have like the three, um, what is it, a 360 degree parallax camera where you can sort of get, you know, it's like creates a virtual reality setting. Um, they have drone photography for um you know, these uh, Jewish historical sites. So that means, you know, synagogues, cemeteries, um, Jewish schools um, in these places. And what's sort of amazing to me is like, you know, you what they did was they interviewed these people who came from these communities. Um, and that's sort of the urgency of the project is that a lot of people who came from these communities are now, you know, quite elderly. Um, and, you know, you'll have a generation then that, you know, when that generation passes on, there really is no one who has the, you know, personal memories of these places. Um, and they interview these people and document them. And then they go and find these um, locations where these people are from. And there's really just nobody else who's writing this history. Um, you know, and especially, I mean, maybe in some larger cities or, you know, you can find histories of, you know, Baghdad or something, but, you know, in like some community in rural Algeria, like, you know, as the one of the chief researcher there told me, he said, you know, he said, I would tell you that we're rewriting this history, but we're not. We're just writing it because nobody else has yet. And it's just a really astonishing project because what it makes you realize is just the richness of this history, but also the loss, you know, because and, and that's what and I think it's a very powerful thing also for people who live in the region now. Um, you know, their Diana sort of goes out of its way to not be political and they really are truly are not. Um, as the researchers have said to me, you know, all we want to do is say that Jews once lived here. Um, but that's now kind of a radical thing to say in um, an era where there's a lot of effort to kind of erase Jewish history. Yeah, so that's a very good point. And I, I also connected to that uh, in terms of Lithuania as well, because uh, I, I would walk the streets in Vilna uh, near the university, where the university one of the oldest universities in, in Europe. Um, and there would be Gaon Street and Jidu Street, um, and these students would be walking through what was the Jewish quarter and then later the Jewish ghetto, and have no idea, honestly, of, of who, who lived in that place. And of course, Vilna at one time was maybe 35 or 40 percent oh, yes. Jewish. Yes. So, so the, the, the value of what Diarna does, you're right, I mean, there's a value there not only for descendants uh, of, of Jews who live there or, or uh, people who want to study history in our own community, but the people who live, the non-Jews who live there as well. Uh, I want to move to uh, another chapter in the book that you wrote uh, about Varian Fry, uh, who was uh, from New Jersey, he's an American, who was sent by the Emergency Rescue Committee to Paris uh, to bring out Paris, you know, France. Okay, that actually, time. In Marseille, actually. In Marseille, in Marseille. Yeah, because Paris and, is and occupied by the Nazis. Yeah. Exactly. So Paris is occupied by the Nazis, uh, Nazi influence, Vichy government uh, in the South. Difficult, uh, if at the very least, for Jews and, and deadly for, for possibly for some, for many. And uh, Fry was sent to bring out intellectuals, artists, and, and poets, and writers, and, and uh, authors, movie people, uh, bring them out uh, to, if he could, to the United States. Um, why did you choose, there are many rescuers, why did you choose Fry? It's an interesting story. He was a troubled individual, uh, but, but was, a, was successful in his, in his quest. Tell us about that. Sure. Well, um, I was interested in him because he was American. Um, you know, you usually hear these stories about righteous Gentiles uh, who were obviously living in Europe and the problem came to them. 
in a sense, right? Because it was, you know, somebody who was living in some village in Poland or France and somebody comes to their door and they make a decision about whether to take that person in. That's more typical, this story about um, righteous Gentiles. What you have with Varian Fry is someone who went out to meet this danger, right? Who like literally, you know, he like, as you said, he was from New Jersey. Um, and then, you know, he was, you know, really part of this sort of like intellectual circles in the United States. And what I thought was interesting about it was that he was sent like with the sanction initially of the US State Department, um, because what they basically decided was like, um, as one, um, there was a, a one diplomat in Portugal, an American diplomat in Portugal who said, after the Nazi takeover of Paris, he says, you know, there's a fire sale on brains here and we're not taking full advantage of it. Um, and what they he meant was to bring these sort of like powerhouse artists and intellectuals to the United States, um, you know, and then, and that was the, that was the goal of this mission. This was not a like let's rescue Jews mission. Um, you know, quite a few of these people were Jewish, but quite a few of them were not. Um, so the people he rescued and what was, and what was astonishing to me was the people he rescued are these like A-list names. I mean, we're talking about People like, you know, Marc Chagall, Marcel Duchamp, Andre Breton, um, you know, I mean, there are many other writers and, and intellectuals who maybe aren't household names today, but were world famous at the time. Um, and, you know, he really was, you know, he ran this underground operation out of Marseille, where he was you know, basically arranging for, he was smuggling people over the Pyrenees into Spain, um, and then arranging for their, um, you know, he arranged for their visas to the United States. So, I mean, this was just like kind of just this amazing. I mean, oh, and he rescued these people with their families. So he ended up rescuing like a, several thousand people. Um, and then what happened though was that then this mission was then shut down by the United States uh, State Department, um, which sort of realized that this was getting them into hot water with their supposed French allies in, in the unoccupied zone in France. So it was an interesting story to me because, yes, he was a very troubled person. Um, you know, and he, you know, but he did this astonishing thing, which no one else wanted to do. I mean, he got this job, essentially, he was kind of a nobody, and, you know, nobody else wanted to do it. And, you know, he, you know, he did this astonishing thing in rescuing all these artists. But then, you know, he lived another 30 years, and these people would not give him the time of day. Um, you know, anytime you try to interact with these people after, after rescuing them, um, they were extraordinarily rude to him and dismissive of him. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And what I thought was most interesting was I was kind of like, why haven't I seen this movie already? Right? Like, why isn't this a better known story in American history? And also even in, you know, among American Jews, like I'm, I was, you know, when I first heard about this, I was sort of like, why didn't I learn about this as a child? Right? Like I heard about Raul Wallenberg when I was a child. I never heard about this guy. And he's American. So I thought that was astonishing. And so what I looked into is sort of like, what I eventually realized in researching his life and the lives of these people he rescued was that basically that the gift he had was not one that we value. And, you know, if you look at what he was asked to save, he was asked to save these people who were considered um, the guardians of European civilization. And who were those people? They were, you know, the artists and the writers and the intellectuals right and the musicians and the creatives those were the people who were considered the guardians of civilization and I just thought you know nobody tried to rescue um you know the Musar movement right which was like you know this movement in eastern European Judaism that was devoted to the study of ethics right that wasn't considered something where we need to like pull out all the stops and save these people right like and that was people who focused their whole lives on the study of righteousness Right. I mean, and as I put it in the book, you know, the gift that he had, you know, everybody said he was a very strange person. He probably was um, um, bipolar. Um, you know, he was just sort of, you know, he was, you know, certainly a tr had a very troubled life. But, you know, as I put it in the book, you know, his oddness was not that of a Marcel Duchamp. It was that of an Ezekiel. Right. I mean, he had his gift was prophecy that he was able to perceive this sort of like blinding reality of, of absolute evil. I mean, he was only one of the only Americans who was writing about the Holocaust. Um, he wrote a cover story for the New Republic in 1942 about the massacre of the Jews. And this was like, like when nobody else was writing about this. I mean, he was reporting on pogroms in 1933 from Berlin. I'm sorry, 1935 from Berlin when nobody else was, was reporting on this. And you know, this was important to him. And you know, even when he was when the State Department ended his mission, he like was screaming his head off about what was happening in Europe and just nobody was listening. And I mean, to me, 
this reminded me of like my studies of the Hebrew prophets. And, you know, that was why I found him to be such a compelling figure. And, and, you know, even, you know, with all of his troubles was like, that was sort of what was, you know, fascinating about him and, and really admirable about him was that he had this vision. I want to ask you, uh, just in the time we have left, uh, very interesting that you write about your son. Uh, who is 10 years old, who is curious about the merchant event. And uh, you uh, find a, a BBC broadcast on your commute to take him back and forth to school. And he listens with you and you stop at certain points and explain uh, some of the Shakespearean language. Uh, but the bigger point here is that, as I un understood what you were writing, and please elaborate, is that you're saying, you know, there really is no way to really put a, a nice cover on on this story, it's um, it's a, a, a it's an it's an anti-Semitic play, um, and even though criticism tries to uh, talk about uh, how uh, Shylock has been made into this human being, uh, at the end of the day, he's forced to convert. So tell us about that experience, which was really interesting because it, it dealt with a young person. I related to this. I can't tell you that I was ten years old when I first heard about. Merchant of Venice, but when I started to hear about it, this is what we talked about. Uh, we talked about that that anti-Semitic. At the end, the story doesn't get any better. It's it each time you read it. So tell us about your your thought process and putting that into the book. Sure. So um, yeah, this was a, an experience I had with my son when he was ten, and we were sort of stuck on a long commute together, and for reasons that are not worth our time to explain here, but are explained in the book, um, kind of against my will, I was sort of you know dragged into uh, sharing this. Uh, you know, listening in the car with him to Merchant of Venice. And, you know, as I was doing this, like, I found myself sort of remembering all the apologetics that go into teaching students about that play, right? You hear in school, like, you know, when you read in school, first of all, the fact that we're still reading this play in school is kind of astonishing. I mean, Shakespeare wrote a lot of plays. This is one of the most performed and studied plays that he wrote. I mean, you, you know, there's every year someone is performing this play. Um, you could probably go to a performance of it like somewhere in the United States, like, you know, in any month of the year of any year, um, which is amazing when you consider that Shakespeare wrote dozens of plays and most of them, you know, don't get any attention at all. So that's very interesting. Um, but what it's also sort of interesting is I remember like studying this play in school and being told like, you know, that, oh, this isn't really anti-Semitic. It's just a product of its time. Right. I mean, there are there's sort of this like elaborate apologetics. Oh, look, you know, Shakespeare was this amazing writer and he makes everybody into a fully fledged human figure, you know. And then, you know, of course, they always point to this like speech that Shylock gives this soliloquy where he says, you know, I am a Jew and hath not a Jew hands, eyes, organs, dimensions. If you prick us, do we not bleed? And they're like, you know, and like they would point to the speech and be like, you know, like every English speaking Jew is supposed to take this as a compliment. Right. And, you know, and I was in sort of, as I said, kind of being forced into sharing this with my child, you know, I kind of presented to him, I'm like, well, you know, there is this problem with this play, but, you know, Shakespeare's this great writer and he makes this person into a fully fledged human being. And my son's like listening to it with me and he's like, where's the part where he's more human? Because I'm not hearing it. And then we get to like this soliloquy and my son called me on it because he's like, he's like, mom, that's the evil supervillain monologue that every supervillain does, right? Like in every Marvel and DC comics, like where the evil supervillain says, you know, I've had a rough life. And if you were like me, if you were me, you'd do the same thing. And that's why I'm going to go kill Batman. Moo -ha -ha -ha. He's like, he's only asking to have to, for revenge. And that is exactly that, that famous monologue. That's the last line of the monologue says that, you know, if you, if you wrong us, aren't we going to want revenge? And the villainy that you teach me, I will execute and I'll better the instruction. I'm probably mangling that, but it's something like that. I mean, he's really just making it, it's, it's exactly that. It's, it, it is an evil supervillain monologue. And it has been sold to Jewish readers as a compliment. I mean, to me, this is the height of gaslighting. And I fell for it. I mean, that's what was astonishing to me. I mean, I have a PhD from Harvard in comparative literature. I like to think I'm a pretty good reader. and. Like I had absorbed this message so deeply that we are supposed to accept this like platter of insults as a compliment. And that was what was shocking to me was that, and I was grateful that my son was able to see it because I was not. What are the, uh, what are the one or two takeaways that you'd like listeners to come away with 
after listening to this conversation and and hopefully reading your book as well? What would you like them to to walk away with? Um, really, that there is this expectation that Jews erase themselves in order to be respected, um, and and that has something that has gone on for thousands of years. There is this expectation that that Jews edit themselves to whatever the specifications of the surrounding culture is. And also that we also we tell stories about, as I said, there's this urge to, we tell stories about dead Jews that make us feel better about ourselves. And what I mean by that is, you know, like this ritual, public ritual we have where like a, you know, some public figure like makes some vaguely anti-Semitic statement then we drag them to a Holocaust museum. Like there's no cost to that, right? Because, you know, Holocaust Museum is, you know, kind of, you go to a Holocaust Museum and what you're going to think is, wow, I'm better than these people, right? Because like, you know, next to Nazis, we all look great, right? I mean, that is a ridiculous standard to hold people to. And what I really, I think, want people to realize is that that demand that we erase our differences is itself a form of hatred. And I, one place that we didn't get to speak about this, so I'm going to mention it now. My book ends, um, well, my book ends in a lot, in, in several different places, but the last thing I talk about in the book in terms of current events are the attacks on the Hasidic community that happened just before the pandemic. And what I found so remarkable and shocking about those attacks is that you did not have the outpouring of public support after the shooting in Jersey City at a kosher uh, supermarket. Um, at the uh, there was a slashing, a machete attack in Muncie, New York, on the Hasidic community in Muncie. You did not have this public outpouring of support like you did at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and that is because what you see is that there's a limit. Jews are only allowed to be so Jewish before they're no longer worthy of public respect. And what I saw, and I looked at all the news articles about the Hasidic community, and I saw, um, you know, about these attacks, and I saw that all of them contained some kind of derogatory references to this community while reporting the attack. And I just think that this is, I mean, and what I find astonishing about that is that, you know, when the Hasidic community attack is attacked, it's not because people are, you know, they're not attacking the Hasidic community. They're attacking these people because they're visible. They're attacking them because they're Jews. And I think that there's something that I think all readers who read this book, I hope will sort of wake up to, which is how much Jews are asked to erase themselves. And I think for all readers, Jewish and non-Jewish, what I'm really trying to open up is the idea of diversity and what the actual challenge of what real diversity entails, which entails welcoming people who are not just like you and me. And I think that's sort of the challenge that goes far beyond the Jewish community and has a lot to do with the future of this country. Well, the book is People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present by Dara Horn, and it's available now wherever you purchase books. Dara, we appreciate your being with us today, boldly challenging us to rethink the ways in which we define our identity and how we narrate Jewish history. Thank you again, and best of luck. Thank you. If you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, b'neibrith.org, to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. Thanks to author Dara Horn for joining me, and thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to the B'nai B'rith podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. For B'nai B'rith, I'm your host, Dan Mariashen. Talk to you again soon.